In this video, we are covering how to place your first order with your wholesale supplier. Let's jump right into it. What's going on YouTube? Welcome back to my channel. For those of you that are new, my name is Brad Sherman. I'm a seven figure seller. I've been selling on Amazon for about four and a half years now. And on this channel, we explore tips, strategies, and experiences that I have had that will help you start and scale up your Amazon FBA wholesale business. In this video, you are joining on episode seven of my Amazon FBA wholesale series. And today's video, we'll be covering how to place your first order with your supplier. We will be covering everything from logistics to payment to shipping directly to Amazon from your supplier's address, shipping to your address, and everything in between. This video will be broken down into three parts for your viewing pleasure. Part number one will cover a higher level overview of logistics and payment to your supplier. How do you ship your goods? How do you get them? How should you appropriately pay your supplier? Part number two will cover my cheat sheet on logistical terms that you should know to sound like an expert when communicating with suppliers. So you guys are definitely going to watch this video from start to finish. I'm going to share with you some key terms that I use with my suppliers on a day-to-day -day basis that took me a while to learn. In this video, I am providing them for you. Part number three of the video will be an in-depth walkthrough of how to send your inventory using Amazon Seller Central into Amazon's warehouse. And I'm going to use pop-ups on the screen as a visual aid to help me guide you guys through how to send your inventory into Amazon's warehouse. For those of you that don't know, Amazon has put out a notice that on September 1st, they will be transitioning their old workflow into the new workflow. So if you guys have not started using the new workflow or you're just a brand new seller, this is a perfect time to watch this video because they will be mandating all sellers to move to that new workflow on September 1st. Before we jump into it, if you guys do enjoy these videos and want to continue seeing more wholesale content, make sure to smash that like button and subscribe and hit that notification bell to follow along on the continued Amazon FBA content that I put out. Without further ado, let's dive right into it. I would like to start out part number one by explaining the importance of a test order. Guys, you are going to always want to place a test order with your supplier, no matter how big of a seller you are, no matter how small of a seller you are. Always place a test order. Sometimes suppliers have higher minimum order quantities. One way to work around this is if let's say your supplier requires a $5,000 order and you are not comfortable investing that amount of money on a first order, you would like to see some sales yourself, what you can do is you can actually order the products retail, maybe on the supplier's website and buy you know, maybe four or five units and get a gauge on how quickly they sell. You might lose a little money on the products, but it's a long-term investment and buying only four or five units is going to do you that justice of, be, of seeing the product sales yourself prior to making an investment. Test orders are the number one way of mitigating risk. At the end of the day, we can look at a keep a chart all day long and see stable, a stable price history. However, nothing's going to give us more of that reassurance than when we actually sell the goods ourselves. So before you guys dive into a large order, make sure to always place a test order. Let's briefly talk about shipping from your supplier to Amazon and shipping from your supplier to yourself and then prepping the units in house and shipping them into Amazon. So we're going to cover the actual workflow to Amazon, but this is an explanation of the logistical components involved in shipping your products. Oftentimes when you purchase from your suppliers, they will package their products in case quantities. This is not always the case, but it frequently is. Case packs of 12, 24, 50, 100, whatever the items are, depending on the size, depending on how their manufacturer does it, they will oftentimes be packaged by the case 
so you will oftentimes want to order by the case with your supplier. Now, you have the option of shipping your products from your supplier directly to Amazon. However, you want to make sure that your supplier is set up to do this before you, you request them to do so. So you're going to want to ask them questions like how much do you charge for shipping and is there a certain order quantity that will qualify for prepaid freight? Prepaid freight just means that the supplier will cover the shipping on your order if it's over a certain amount. Keeping that in mind, if your supplier ships for free over a certain amount and you have the ability to order that amount, you might want to ship your products to you for a couple reasons. One being quality control. If your supplier has not shipped direct to, directly to Amazon before, you want to make sure that everything is going to be checked in properly. The units might have to be prepped, FN SKU labeled, polybagged. There's different prep requirements by Amazon, so you have to investigate the specific ASIN prior to actually placing that order and see what are Amazon's prep requirements prior to placing the order. That way you know if let's say the products do require bubble wrap or poly bagging, something that your supplier does not do for them, well, if you shipped it direct to Amazon, you would have to pay Amazon 70 cents per prep requirement. So if you ship directly to Amazon, you would have to pay Amazon a certain fee per item. So Amazon's rate for poly bagging items is 70 cents a piece and their rate for F and SKU labeling is 55 cents a piece. This can add up over time if you're doing heavy volume. However, if it makes more sense to send your products directly to Amazon and have Amazon do the prepping and pay them to do it versus incur the shipping costs from your supplier to your location, then that is what has to be done. Now, sometimes suppliers are accustomed at shipping to Amazon and they ship for other Amazon sellers. In this case, they might actually apply the product labels themselves and they might even polybag the products themselves if it is a requirement and they are accustomed to it. So those are all things to keep in mind. Oftentimes the supplier's rate to um, prep the products or label them is cheaper than Amazon, but you just have to consider all of these factors. If you're throwing your hands in the air because Amazon's cost is too high and your supplier's not going to prep the items, Consider just having your product sent to yourself and you doing the prep work that is necessary. Guys, there's no substitute for actually getting a hands-on feel of the product that you are selling and learning that process of shipping to Amazon. It's going to make you more knowledgeable long-term of the logistics process. So now that we've covered some components on logistics, let's talk about how to pay your supplier. You can pay your supplier in three basic forms. One is an ACH payment, two is a credit card, and three are, is a net term account. And ultimately with the third option, you're going to have to pay them with one of the first options. So let's talk about what an ACH or wire transfer is. A wire transfer is an immediate transfer of funds which generally has a pretty large fee associated with it. For me personally, where I bank, it costs me about $40 to send a wire transaction from uh, my bank to a, to a different bank. Now, that will definitely add up over time. Although it's quick and happens immediately, you're going to want to consider the ACH option because while ACH might take one to two days to actually transfer the funds, it is basically free. It costs me about 13 cents to send an ACH transaction, which is astronomically cheaper than sending a wire transfer. And most companies that you work with, I would say 9.5 out of 10 will accept ACH payments and do and utilize ACH throughout their normal course of business. ACH just stands for Automated Clearing House and it's a form of transferring funds from one bank to another. Credit cards are also a great option to pay your supplier with and they're also a great option to accumulate reward points. If you guys haven't seen my video on my top favorite credit cards for using in my Amazon FBA business, I'll link it up above, make sure to check that out. Now with credit cards, of course you have to be careful with the amount of debt that you leverage in your business. However, credit cards are a great option because they might give you 30 days before you have to actually pay off the credit card, which gives you some time to sell the product, get back some cash, and then pay down the credit card. Now with credit cards, sometimes suppliers, they might charge you a 3% transaction fee associated with the credit card, which is simply a fee that they pay that they're passing on to you. So before I make a payment to my supplier, I always ask, 
if they charge the purchaser a 3% transaction fee in order to use a credit card? And if the answer is yes, then I will default to an ACH payment. These are all different ways to save money long-term for your business. If you're repeatedly paying 3% on your orders, you know if you're spending a lot of money with your suppliers, this is gonna add up over time. So you want to be mindful of that and pay your supplier in the most cost-effective manner for your business. Now, I would say in my experience, most suppliers absorb the 3% fee and don't generally pass it on to the purchaser. However, I've come across a number of suppliers that do. So just check on that before you actually purchase your products. The third form of payment is called a net 30 account. And this is an open terms account with your supplier or a line of credit that where your supplier is giving you a certain threshold that you can purchase from them. Now, let's say you have a $5,000 limit on your 30 day um, net term account. So what that means is that you can purchase products from your supplier and let's say you purchase $5,000 worth of inventory, they will invoice you on whatever date you purchase that. Let's say it's August 1st, you will have 30 days to pay them from that invoice because they're giving you an open line of credit for 30 days. Sometimes they'll give you a 15 day line of credit. Maybe they'll give you a 60 day line of credit. You know, that does happen, but the most common is a net 30 account. Net 30 accounts are great because it gives you the opportunity to scale your business. You don't have to pay your supplier until 30 days, which oftentimes means that you would have already sold through the product at that point. Now, it doesn't happen all the time that way, but you could maybe at least sell through half of your inventory and not lay out as much cash up front. Net 30 accounts have been great for helping us scale the business because it gives me the ability to not have to lay out ca cash with all of these different suppliers up front, rather put it on a, an account and then pay off the account after I've sold through at least some of the inventory. However, bear in mind with net 30 accounts, you have to have been in business for a few years probably and have some sort of business credit. So it's kind of like a snowball with your business credit. Once you get an account with one company and you prove your credit worthiness with them, then you get an account with another and another and another, it snowballs over time and eventually you're pretty much able to get credit accounts with any suppliers that you attempt to open an account with because you have a list of trustworthy credit references that you can send to them. Let's dive into part number two of the video. Part number two is going to cover some cheat terms that I use on a day-to-day -day basis in wholesale that will make you look more professional with your suppliers when you're communicating with them. So we're going to run down a list and I have a list here. This is not all encompassing. There's plenty of other terms that are out there, but this is a good beginner's guide to communicating with your suppliers more professionally. So term number one is MOQ, which stands for minimum order quantity. A minimum order quantity is just the minimum amount of goods that you have to purchase from your supplier on a certain order. The first order is oftentimes called your opening MOQ because you are placing an opening order with the supplier. So what is the minimum opening MOQ that you need with your supplier is a common question that you might ask. The next term is PPD freight. And what that stands for is prepaid freight, which is a certain level that your supplier requires you to purchase from them. It could be $1,000, $2,000, it could be 100 units, whatever the amount is, the certain level that they have in order to pay freight to your location. So oftentimes suppliers will cover freight as an incentive of purchasing more from them. Parcel, small parcel, SPD, all interchangeable terms and just refer to shipping ground through say UPS, FedEx, um, United States Postal Service. It's shipping boxes, it's not shipping pallets. So pallets is the next term, which is an LTL or FTL shipment. And what that means is that you are shipping by tractor trailer load. So LTL stands for less than truck load. Oftentimes we will get pallet shipments that come in that are less than truck load. 
Full truckload is an FTL shipment where the goods that are being transported on the tractor trailer all belong to you and you're filling up an entire tractor trailer of pallets. The next term is a net term account and we already covered this, but let's discuss it one more time. Net terms is an open account that you have with your supplier where they give you a certain line of credit and a date that you have to pay them back by. It is purely based on credit worthiness and business credit. So you're going to want to provide them with credit references when they ask if you would like to have an open account with them. Alternatively, you can opt for a prepay account, which is essentially means you are paying for your goods prior to them dispatching via credit card, ACH, or wire transfer. 1% 10 net 30. That means that your supplier is giving you an open account of 30 days. They're also offering an incentive to pay the invoice sooner within 10 days by giving you a 1% discount on your invoice. Now this is an, often a good idea to take advantage of the 1% discount if you have the cash flow ability. 1% might not sound like that much, but if you're placing let's say a $10,000 order with your supplier and you have an open account with them, 1% definitely adds up over time. So consider paying your supplier a, within 10 days if they do offer a one or 2% discount. FOB origin. FOB stands for free on board. And what FOB origin means is that the purchaser, you, are responsible for the goods once they leave the seller's dock. So if something happens to the goods, if they're damaged, if they are lost, you bear the responsibility if your shipping terms with your supplier is FOB origin. FOB destination just means the exact opposite. The seller, your supplier, bears the responsibility of the goods until they have been received by the purchaser, which is yourself. One last term I would like to cover is a lift gate. When I first started in wholesale, I had a difficult time wrapping my head around um, LTL shipments and how the pallet was gonna be delivered to my residential location. So I want to share this with you guys because I know it's something that I was searching for an answer for when I was just starting. Can you deliver a pallet load to your residence? The answer is yes, absolutely. Is it preferred? Not necessarily, but it's certainly not a problem. We've done it many times. Now, with a residential delivery on a truck coming to your house, you're going to have to specify that the truck needs to have a lift gate. And what a lift gate is, is a tail end lift on the back of the truck that is able to be raised and lowered by the driver when the truck is parked. Now, your pallet is on the truck. So in order to get that pallet down onto the ground, there needs to be some sort of apparatus, a forklift, a lift gate, a loading dock, in order to move the pallet out of the truck. So because we're del delivering to a residence and we don't have a loading dock, the truck must have a lift gate and the truck also needs to have a lift gate if there's no loading dock at all. So it could be shipping to a commercial warehouse, but the truck still would have to have a lift gate if there's no dock. Now, what the driver will do is they will park the truck at your residence or at your commercial warehouse and they will open the back of the truck, utilize a pallet jack, which is on the truck if you have requested for a lift gate. They will use a pallet jack to move the pallet onto the lift gate. They will then lower themselves standing on the lift gate and the pallet down onto the level ground and they will, using the pallet jack, transport the pallet into your warehouse or to your house. That is how that process looks. So if you don't have a dock, you will need a lift gate on the truck. Part number three of episode seven is going to cover the new workflow into Amazon. How do we send our inventory into Amazon using Seller Central? And instead of doing a screen share with you guys, I want to use visual aids and pop-ups on the screen because I think it's going to be more captivating for you and you'll be able to see some more minute details that we might not get in a screen share. So the first step when sending your inventory into Amazon, if it's a new product and not a send and replenish product, which we'll cover at the end, 
If it's a new product, what you're going to want to do in step number one is toggle up to catalog and press add a product. From here, there will be a search bar that appears in the middle of your page where you will put the ASIN number in and search for it. At this point, you will be prompted by Amazon to select the condition in which you want to sell your products, which should nine times out of 10 be new, and then you will press sell this product. If it says apply to sell on this page and it does not say sell this product, that means you are a gated seller for this particular product or category and you will have to submit an invoice and possibly other documentation in order to get ungated by Amazon. Step number three is the offer page which provides information such as seller SKU, your price, FBA fulfillment, merchant fulfillment, and so on. What you will want to do is select your seller SKU which is only seen by you. Oftentimes it might be useful for accounting purposes to put your cost of your product in your seller SKU and say what the item is. That's just a suggestion, but it doesn't have to be done. Your seller SKU can be whatever you want. And if you don't put anything in there, Amazon will automatically generate a unique seller SKU for the particular product. You will then put the price that you were listing your product for, which should be the competitive price that it's going for on Amazon. And then you will select fulfillment by Amazon. You would like Amazon to fulfill this product for you. If you were to select that the seller will fulfill it, you are selecting a merchant fulfilled shipment and you will have to enter a quantity in the box. When you select FBA, you will not have to enter a quantity there. We will do that later on in the process. You'll scroll down a little bit further and you may see the option to list in Canada or Mexico. We will skip over this for now and press save and finish. Step number four, you will be prompted to select the barcode type. So in this particular example, Amazon is requiring an FN SKU barcode. There's a number of reasons why Amazon might require that. And if they require it, it's not something that we question, it's just something that we have to do. So if you're shipping directly from your supplier to Amazon, either your supplier or Amazon has to apply the FN SKU barcode. If you're shipping to yourself, then you have to apply the FN SKU barcode to the product, which is printed on a 30 up label sheet. If your product had UPC codes that were recognized by Amazon, Amazon might allow you to select manufacturer barcode, in which case you would not have to use the FN SKU barcode and you can use the manufacturer barcode. Might be a convenient method because sometimes we can save on costs that way and your items might get checked in a little bit faster than if they have to be labeled by say Amazon. Select save and continue and it'll bring us to a screen of sending our inventory into Amazon. From here, you will select the address that your products are shipping from. If it's your address, put your address. If, you're, if it's your supplier's address, obtain that information from them and put your supplier's address. So here's where things get a little bit different in the new workflow than the old workflow. And in my opinion, it is better than the old workflow in this aspect. What you will want to do is select if your products are going to be individual units or case packed. If you guys don't understand the difference between individual units and case packed, Check out my shipping to Amazon video that I previously released, which covers the requirements for individual units versus case packs. Long and short of it is that case pack products, all of the units within the case must be the same, whereas individual products can be mixed SKUs in the same box. So for our example, we are going to use case pack. So in this example, you will select the drop down next to individual units. You will then be prompted to a screen to select the prep requirements. In this particular instance, this is no prep needed unless Amazon says that it requires specific prep requirements. You will then select the pencil that's right next to create a case pack template and it will bring you to a page where you have the option to name your template, put the weight, dimensions, and number of units in the box and then save the information. On here, on the case pack template, you will be presented with the option of inputting your prep requirements, which as we stated for this example, is no prep needed. Because Amazon already told us that the, F, the Amazon barcode is required, there is a label requirement and you will be given the option to select either the seller or Amazon. In this example, we will select the seller. You will then select save your template and then it will bring you to the same screen where you are able to enter the number of cases that you are sending into Amazon. For our purposes, let's say we are sending in one case containing 24 units. And in this particular example, it is a topical based product. So Amazon is requiring an expiration date. 
If you're shipping from your supplier directly to Amazon, you will want to obtain that information from your supplier and input your expiration date. If your supplier is shipping to you, you will have the physical goods in hand and be able to input the expiration date yourself. You'll then be presented with the option to print the SKU labels, which will be done so on a 30 up sheet, as mentioned earlier, and press continue. At this point, you've completed the first part of the send to Amazon prep process. Now what you will do is confirm your shipping mode. If you're shipping LTL versus SPD, which we discussed earlier in the video. Now, it's going to make sense times to ship LTL more than SPD. And in those cases, it usually means you're shipping a lot of product. In our example, we're only shipping one case of 24, so we will select the small parcel delivery option. At this point, it'll show us what fulfillment center our inventory is being sent to, the cost of our labels, and give us the option to purchase the box labels and then print them. Ultimately, what you will do is press purchase box labels and then Amazon will generate you a UPS label and an Amazon partner carrier label on which you would apply to the top of the box next to each other. That is it, the process of shipping to Amazon FBA using the new workflow. As we said earlier on in the process, that particular example is for a new product if we were to add a new product. Now, what happens if you're replenishing your inventory? All you do if you're replenishing, as you can see from the pop-up on the screen, you select the box that's right next to the product or products that you would like to send into Amazon. You will then select the drop-down arrow, press send and replenish, and it will bring you to the same beginning send to Amazon workflow that we started at. That is it for this video, guys. I hope that gave you an in-depth idea of the three main points that are associated with placing your first order. To recap, number one, we covered the importance of a test order, logistical concerns such as prep requirements and costs, as well as how to pay your supplier. Number two, we covered some of the most important shipping terms that you should know to sound more professional with your supplier. And finally, we covered the new send to Amazon workflow and how to actually utilize that in Seller Central when sending your inventory into Amazon. I hope you guys found a lot of value from this video, and if you did, make sure to smash that like button and share the video with a friend. If you guys have any comments or questions, make sure to drop them down below in the comment section, and always remember to hit that subscribe button and notification bell if you want to stay up to date on all of the future wholesale content that I will be releasing. That is it for episode seven. Thank you guys so much for watching. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you next time.